do some introductions. As an introduction, we'd like to acknowledge that our mission uh, at Vos Library is to advance learning, inspire curiosity, enrich lives, and promote community. As an introduction, um, Dr. Berger, since 2003, has published about 100 scholarly articles, and he has been the decorated paper columnist for Hand Papermaking Newsletter, for which publication he has written over 60 articles. Since 2003, he has been adjunct professor in the School of Library and Information Science at Simmons University, and adjunct professor in the iSchool School of Library and Information Science at the University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. In both schools, he teaches courses in rare books, special collections, and bibliography. At Simmons, he also teaches a course in editing in the Department of Communications. I knew that when he corrected my papers. As an English <laughs> professor, he taught at the University of California, Davis, and as an adjunct at the University of California, Riverside. From 1987 to 1990, Dr. Berger was head of printed books and head of manuscripts at the American Antiquari Antiquarian Society. He was head of special collections and university archivist at the University of California, Riverside, from 1990 until 2000. From 2000 to 2003, he was the head of California Center for the Book based at UCLA, where he was adjunct, pro adjunct professor in their library school. Dr. Berger was the Ann C. Pingree Director of the Phillips Library at Peabody Essex Museum in Massachusetts from 2007 to 2014, and is now Director Emeritus at that library. With his wife, Michelle V. Clunan, he is the proprietor of the Doe Press, which has published fine press books, including Tom Gunn, uh, Ernest Kroll, um, well, the, sorry, those are the authors, uh, Lament, Six Letters to an Apprentice, Banjo Dog, and Michelle V. Clunan, The Invisible Presence of Gertrude Stiles. Also with Michelle, he amassed a collection of over 22,000 pieces of paper, now the Berger Clunan Collection of Decorated Paper at the Cushing Library, Texas A&M University. So here to speak with us, not only about paper, but his book, what we, which we have at Vos Library, The Book of Death, Please help me welcome Dr. Berger. Hi, nice to be here. Welcome to my home. Thanks for showing up tonight. Thank um, you. What I, sure, it's a pleasure. Uh, what I want to do is talk about five or six hours about my murder mystery and about seven or eight hours about my decorated papers, but there's not enough time, so we'll have to curtail that a bit. Um, <clears throat> let me talk just briefly then about the Book of Death. Um, when I was teaching, um, I taught creative writing and um, editing courses. And I was also teaching courses on book history, uh, medieval manuscript production. I had a course called the, the Medieval Book from Sheep to Shelf, because it starts with the sheep and it winds up on the shelf. and. Um, I noticed that many writers who were writing about books, printing, paper making, book binding, calligraphy, and all the other book arts often got it wrong. They got things wrong. Well, since I've been a paper maker and a book binder and a printer, and um, I cast my own printing type, I make paper and all that stuff, I wanted to write a novel where all the details were done correctly. Now, at one point in my career, there was um, a very famous bookseller named Mark Hoffman, who was a member of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, uh, but he was lapsed. He left the church. He was a great bookseller. He found things that nobody ha has, had ever seen before. One of the things that he had found was the very first thing printed in what became the United States, 1639. It was a little broadside called The Ode of a Free Man. Scholars knew about this thing, and they had been looking for it for early centuries, but 
no copy existed. He found the copy and he presented it to the Library of Congress to sell it and they put it through all kinds of tests and it passed all the tests. But he wanted $3 million for it, so they decided not to buy it. He offered it to the American Antiquarian Society. They decided not to buy it at that price, though they submitted it to a whole bunch of tests as well. They checked the ink, the paper, the type, the text, everything about it checked out properly. Well, after a few bombs went off, killing a few people, a couple of people, and injuring him, police realized that those bombs were set by Mark Hoffman. And the, the third bomb, which blew up his hands and injured him bad, badly, didn't kill him, had a particular signature to it, and they recognized that as the signature of two other bombs that killed other people. So you say, what does this have to do with any of this to going on today? Well, he knew that he was caught. And um, so instead of going to trial and being found guilty for murdering two people and being put to death, he confessed his crimes and um, then he was going to prison for life, which is where he still is, by the way. And in his deposition, he revealed that not only the broad side of the uh, the oath of a free man, but umpteen other very valued documents that he had sold to libraries and private collectors all over the place were forgeries, and he had fooled everybody including all the greatest experts in the country, figuring out about the paper and the ink and the typefaces and the text and all the other features that went into the production of his forgeries. So his deposition was not published, but I was able to get a copy of it because I was working at the American Antiquarian Society. And when I read it, I figured what a genius this guy was. Too bad that he, you know, wasted his genius on such nefarious practices. But that sparked the idea of writing a novel about a pamphlet that is either genuine or it's a forgery. And that was what got me to writing the Book of Death. And as a medievalist, I knew a great deal about this Ars Moriendi theme, the art of dying. The church prepared people to die. And it meant getting your soul cleaned and saying the right prayers and doing the right deeds and all the rest of that stuff. And there were many, many books in the Middle Ages and even in the early days of printing on this Ars Moriendi the art of dying, and uh, hundreds of books uh, produced. One of them was produced in Germany by an actual printer named Konrad Kachelofen, and only one copy of the German text exists. It's defective. It's the New York Public Library, and that's the only copy known, and it's missing pages. And for centuries, people didn't know what was in it? Well, that's the basis. And that, that's all fact, by the way. That was the basis of the novel that I wrote. Now, if you've read it, you know how it ends. If you haven't read it, I'm not going to spoil it for you. I just wanted you to know that all of the details about production and book forgery all come out in this murder mystery. Um, a couple of other little uh, snippets. Um, many of the dealers who are mentioned in here are real life people, but I've changed their names to protect the innocent or the guilty. Um, just one little example, and you can see if you can figure out who the others are, but there's a, a pair of booksellers in Los Angeles, Lou and Ben Weinstein. Well, one of my characters is named Harry Lou Ben. <laughs> It's subtle. 
Harry Lubin. Well, Lou and Ben, I'm sure, would figure that out. I'm not sure that anybody else would. But I, I sort of make fun of them a little bit in the book because they deserve to be made fun of. But they also turned out to be some fabulous booksellers. Anyway, there's a lot of jokes in there and a lot of fun. And I had a, an, an immensely wonderful time writing this book. And, and I tell people, I never read a book a second time. I have too many reading you know, books to read. But this book I enjoyed so much, I read this one twice. Um, so anyway, I, I do want to get on to um, the, the decorated paper business. And um, at this point, I'd like to stop and ask if you have any questions about this book. Um, I, I brought along several answers with me today. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to see if I can apply some of my answers to those questions. So you're welcome to unmute and ask away um, or put a question in the chat. I'd be happy to read it for you if you want to stay off video. Can I ask by a show of hands, how many of you have actually read the book? Oh, well. Ah. Uh. Yeah, you guys, you got to get this. This is really a fun book. You, do. you know, just to, to prepare myself for this little session, I read it again uh, over the last couple of days. I really enjoyed it. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad I wrote it. So um, I have to say, Dr. Berger, um, sitting through your course and reading this book, it was so cool to see all of the things that I had learned in the course threaded throughout the book, right? So I knew what an incannabulum was. I was so excited. I knew what that was. Um, oh, that's great. But, but there were also other things that you had talked about that, um, you know, the ink that was used and blah, blah, blah. I don't want to get into it for other people, but um, your wit and the way you wove the char characters together, it was just a real lot of fun to read and really a true mystery. So thank you. Well, Thank you. I, I should point out that there are a couple of um, characters in here who are sort of not pleasant people, but that's real life, isn't it? Sure. And, uh, and the, um, the business about collecting books, about appraising books, about book auctions, it's all based on the real world. So you learn a lot about mm -hmm. the book world especially the antiquarian book world, but about buying and selling books and about uh, pricing and things like that from this. True. Zip is yeah. asking you, when was it published? We only learned about it now. Oh, well, uh, actually, it's funny that you should say that because I wrote it many years ago. Uh, and then I, uh, in, in 2017, I went through it and fixed it up and uh, published it. So it's only about three and a half years ago when it was published. Um, it's uh, available on Amazon. Uh, or at your local library. Oh, uh, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, if you can get to your local library, all the better. Yeah. I, I heavily support public libraries. I love them. All right. And Drew is asking, Drew Laughlin, it sounds like this may be an inside joke. Does it have any exclamation points in it? <laughs> uh, yeah, there are a few, but not too many. I really don't like exclamation <laughs> points unless they are really necessary, as in the sentence that I just spoke. <laughs> just a few. Any other questions for Dr. Berger? But, you know, apropos of that, there are a lot of question marks because it is a murder mystery, you know. And there's a whole genre called biblio mystery. There's, there are many, many books out there that are biblio mysteries, mysteries, murder mysteries that have to do with books. And this one, at least this one gets all the book stuff accurate. I've been in the book world for um, more than a half a century, and I know a lot about buying and selling and, and printing and paper making and book binding and all that stuff. So it's all it's all accurate in my in my tech. Gary is asking you, speaking of authors who may not get book details quite right, have you read yeah. Elizabeth Daly? Question mark. Her detective character was supposedly an expert on old manuscripts and papers. 
I have not. Please send me the citation and I'll read her work. Thank you. Yeah, for, yeah good tip. Thank you for that. Yeah, good tip. There are lots of biblio mysteries, hundreds of them out there, but only one book of death. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, oh, um, he's saying one of her books was the Book of the Dead. Hmm. The Book of the Dead. Maybe similar. I'm oh. writing it down. Okay, I'm writing this down. The okay. Book of the Dead. And what is the name of the author? Elizabeth Daly. D A L Y. D A L Y. Okay, it's on my list. I'll get it. Thank you. I love that kind of citation. <laughs> I sure I'm glad I showed up today because I learned something new. <laughs> All right, anybody uh, else? Let's see. One other thing. Oh, you have, you have something else there? We do not. Go right ahead. Okay, one other little thing. One of my students bought a copy of the book and she said she loved it, but she was um sad that i couldn't sign it for her because we were doing all our teaching now online so i mailed her an index card with my name signed on it then i mailed her another one with my name signed and saying thanks for buying this book and then i mailed her a third one with my name and thanks for buying this book and a whole note to her so i'd be happy to do that for you and you'll have a signed copy even though it's not it'll be on the on the cards that I'll mail you. Fabulous. So if you, if you want to do that, you can wind up with a signed copy. And I got to point out, uh, we've sold a lot of copies of this, but hers is the only one that I've signed so far. Ah. So you, you might get something really extraordinary if, <laughs> if you want yeah. me to sign a copy. Does that <laughs> offer go to everybody at this um, session right now, Dr. Berger? Everybody who wants to, I'll just, I'll send your card. So you and I can decide which email address you want them to request that through. Right. And Sid at Simmons.edu. Okay. I keep it Simmons and it's Sid, S-I-D, Sid at Simmons.edu. It's so easy that even I can remember it. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't see any other questions about the book. So you are welcome to shift if you would like to. Okay. Let me, uh, just a moment ago. Oh, this is embarrassing. Here it is. I was looking from my phone. I need this for something. I'm going to turn off this light for a moment. And I'm going to show you something. Now, you all see this? This is a piece of paper, right? It's nothing more than a regular piece of paper. However, let me, uh, it's just a piece of paper, right? I'm going to put a light behind it. And you're going to see, do you all see that? I'm going to take the light away. I'm going to put the light back. That is a watermark. You know what watermarks are, everybody? Well, this is a very special one. So we're going to talk about decorated papers. And um, I was teaching a course starting in 1971. I was teaching a course called The History of the Book. And I been teaching it ever since. I taught it yet again this year. Um, the history of the book entails all kinds of physical phenomena, including the creation and use of paper. So I figured I needed to tell my students everything they needed to know about paper as part of book history. So I, I went out and I, I bought some pieces of paper to show them handmade papers and machine made papers and so on. And after I had about 30 or 40 sheets, I saw one that I didn't have the likes of, so I bought that one. And then I saw another one that I didn't have the likes of, so I got that. And the next thing I knew, I had 300 sheets of paper. So, and then I saw some more that I didn't have the likes of, so I bought those. And after 22,000 pieces, 
I was still seeing papers that I had never seen anything the likes of before. So I kept buying until the collection eventually went to, let me, uh, can you see this? That's my t-shirt for today, the Book Arts Program at Texas A&M University. That's where the, the collection went because they have a Book Arts Program there. Um, what I was trying to do in my collecting was to acquire one copy, one kind of every kind of paper that I could. Can you all see this slide? You all see the slide that says my life yes. with Okay. My life with paper is a very famous book written by Dard Hunter, My Life with Paper. He's the most prolific paper historian in history. He's a guy who made paper, cast paper, uh, wrote about paper, and so on and so forth. And he, he made his own books from scratch. He, he made his own printing types, his own paper. He wrote his texts and all that. And so he did a whole bibliography, My Life with Paper. So I used that as the title of a lecture I gave a couple of years ago. This piece of paper is now hanging on the wall of my home here. This is one of the most magnificent sheets of marble pig you'll ever see, done by the greatest marbler in history. I'm not going to get into that. We'll see her work later on. Um, what we were doing was, my wife and I, we were collecting papers and paper-like materials. Um, just a, a simple little question for you all. What would life be like if there were no paper? I'm just going to let that sink in for a bit. The cups we get at, you know, Starbucks, bathroom tissues, newspapers, millions of uses, millions of uses. So paper is, according to some scholars, the most important invention in history. Any idiot could have invented the wheel. It took a genius to invent an alphabet and something to write it on. The alphabet and paper. And even the alphabet would have gone nowhere if we didn't have a surface like paper to spread it around the world. So the most important invention in history. It starts out with things like this. Now, this is a proto paper. It's topicloth. This is everything you're going to see in the slides were uh, are from our collection. Uh, unfortunately, the 22,000 pieces are now in Texas. But I don't know how it happens. You know, when you when you take a book off a shelf, the next morning another one is propagated into its space. We have about a thousand pieces of paper in our collection here at home, and they'll wind up in Texas as well. This is a piece of topper cloth used in book bindings. So it is a book fin related phenomenon, but it is not paper. It's made out of fibers that have been pounded down and flattened into a, a sheet. Uh, here's a piece of amato or amate. This is Mexican bark paper, but it's not paper. It's just fibers that have been beaten down into a flat sheet. Paper is made from fibers that have been macerated. In other words, you take anything fibrous and you beat it up in certain machines or tools, and all the fibers come apart from one another, and they're all floating around in water. You pick them up on a uh, essentially a sieve, and all the fibers land on the sieve, and they mat together, and that forms paper. So, so far, we haven't seen a real piece of paper yet. Now, this is a piece of 17th century uh, paste paper. You take paste, you color it, you put some pigment in it, and here, you have three different colors. We have the purple paste here, the, the dark red paste here, and the yellow paste here. 
and somebody has splotched that down on a piece of paper and then with fingertips has just moved that paste around with the fingertips. Uh, uh, can you see my cursor moving around, by the way? Is that, okay, good. Yeah. And so that the paste has been manipulated into that pattern. That's a piece of paste paper. Had hundreds and hundreds of these uh, uh, 17th and 18th century paste papers in the collection. This is a piece of handmade paper with wire lines going across and chain lines going this way. This was made in, well, anybody want to guess? Does anybody want to guess what year this was made in? Oh, son of a gun, the paper maker, J. Barcham Green, put the date into the watermark. That's 1976 that sheet was made. So we've seen two different kinds of paper, paste paper, and we've seen handmade paper that's just plain. This, this is a sheet of paper with light behind it. Marbled paper. This is Carly Frigga, the world's greatest marbler. I've written a, a whole book about her. I should tell you, I've published five books about paper making and about 70 articles about paper making. Uh, and I've given lectures in Japan and China and all over the US on the subject. Um, Anyway, Carly is undoubtedly the greatest marbler in history, as you'll see um, as we go through here. This is one of her uh, marbled sheets. Here is a piece of paste paper made by a German artist. What she did was she took paste, yellow paste, on a sponge and she sponged it over the sheet. So you can see these striations where the sponge has put the paste down onto the sheet and she waited till it dried. And then she put little splotches of dark green paste down and manipulated them with tools or her finger to make these little patterns on the sheet. So you see the overall sheet of paste paper with this little, decorative elements on top. And for some reason, she also decided to put a few lines in it like that one there and this one here to add some beauty to it. Here is a sheet, if I can maximize this a bit here. Is that better? Can you see that better? It's about the same. Okay. Okay, so this is a sheet that's block printed. In other words, a wood block, well, more than one wood block, because how many colors do we have? Look at the butterfly. We have the green in the butterfly wing. We have the orange in the butterfly wing. And then we have black. So at least three colors, at least three, and possibly other colors were used to print this sheet. That means that they had to create three separate wood blocks, one for each of the colors. So this was printed using three separate wood blocks. The sheet was done about 1720, maybe 1730, somewhere in there. This was one of the more wonderful sheets in our collection. Um, let me move down here. Okay, we're gonna move on to a piece of black varnished paper that's embossed. So embossing, so, so we've had marbling, we've had paste paper, we've had block printing, now we have embossing. This is an embossed sheet. Now, very, very rare for these to survive. This is from about 1750. This black sheet of paper was over a funeral oration. So it's, it, they call it funeral paper or something to that effect. Um, and that we and this was the binding for the uh, the funeral oration, which, by the way, was on the other side of this sheet here. Another form of decoration, which was absolutely spectacular, and this comes from Japan. And I should say that the Japanese are the number one paper makers in history. They've made more papers and more decorations and more types of decoration more perfectly than any other culture in the world. This is a sheet of chiogami. Chiogami means 
decorated paper done in a particular way. And I have, wrote a book called Chiagami, Chiagami paper, it's called. Um, this is done, the original Chiagami papers were done with wood blocks, but in the um, Meiji period, starting around 1868, the Japanese developed a technique of stenciling to, to decorate paper. So this was done, this is a sheet from about 1940, a, a, a possibly unique. I've never seen another one of these before or since I, I acquired it. Um, every color you see on here is put on through a different stencil. So you have the dark red, this blue, this blue, a different tone of red, a pink, a yellow, a green, um, and so on. This is probably about a 10, 10 color sheet, which means that somebody had to cut a stencil for each of the colors that was imparted onto this sheet. So there was one stencil that all it did was put these reds in here. Another stencil that did these sort of mustard colors here. This one here, it's little area with the mustard on it. And this area with the mustard on it, that was done through a stencil, through one stencil there and so on. And not only did they have to get all the colors in, they had to get them in the right place because each stencil was a separate piece of paper. The stencils were made out of paper, by the way. So they, each one of these had to be positioned. Each one of the stencil had to be positioned so that each color came in in the, exactly the right spot. So it wouldn't be, you know, mess up the image. Now, will you see the next one? This is a sheet of Chiogami from about 1970, done using the stencils with about 22 colors, maybe 25 colors in there. I haven't analyzed it closely enough to try to figure out all the colors, but that is one giant piece of paper. That's it's, uh, 22 by about 40, something like that is the size of that sheet, a huge sheet of paper. Uh, we had probably 50 of these giant sheets of paper in the uh, collection. Um, this, by the way, is paper mold. One of the paper molds that I make my own paper on, I made this paper mold myself. And uh, the, the um, fibers fall onto the surface of the mold. This is called the decal. The decal holds the, the fibers onto the surface of the mold while the water is draining through. And as the water drains out, all the fibers settle on the, on the screen and the fibers mat and you have a sheet of paper. This is another kind of Japanese paper called Tajima. It's folded in paper, special way of folding the sheets and dyeing the paper. Unbelievable that the Japanese could do things like this. And it comes in many colors, many shapes, and many configurations of the folds. You can have uh, octagonal figures and hexagonal figures with all different colors in them in the folding. The next sheet is called lace paper, another Japanese technique. It's just a piece of paper made in a special way. It's a double sheet. They make the background sheet first, and then they make another sheet of paper that's on top of that. But the one that goes on top of it is not a full sheet. The only place that fibers exist on the paper mold is where you see them landing here on the first sheet. And when the second sheet is pressed against that first sheet, it becomes a single sheet of paper. Beautiful lace paper. And it comes with dozens of different designs. This happens to be a, quite, a, quite a beautiful one. Now, some of the rarest papers of all are called Dutch gilt. Dutch meaning Deutsch, German, and gilt meaning gold. Now, papers were also made with silver and bronze, but the gold ones were the most valuable and the rarest. These sheets, they would start out with a, a piece of handmade paper. They would put down, usually would put down a colored paste over the surface of the sheet. And then they would take a metal plate carved into this pattern, whatever the pattern is, the pattern could be animals, 
flowers, people, children, horses, anything, anything, geometric patterns. The plate, they would take a large leaf of metallic foil and stamp it down onto the sheet. These sheets come from about 1690 up to around 1790 or 1800. And they, they stopped making around 1800. They're German. A, a few of them were made in Italy. A couple of them were made in England. 99% of them were made in German, Dutch, hand, Dutch, Dutch gilt papers. You can't find the mark anymore. If you do, they run anywhere from 1500 to about $5,000 a sheet. They're very, very rare. And we had about 85 of them in our collection. Now, text has them all. They were used for book bindings, and here's a good example of one. Here's another one, which is now in Texas, a very rare one showing soldiers. Some of it, here's Schutzer, the shooter, the Prager, the fusilier, and then actual people, Dorvar and York and so on, famous people in uh, German history, Blatov. Um, so this is another Dutch guild sheet. On rare occasion, you'll see them printed with no um, paste paper background onto them. We had several of those too. Here is the Turks. Either Turk marbling was invented either in Persia or in Turkey. The Turks claim it was done in you know, invented in Turkey, and of course the Persians, the, the, the Iranians say it was done in Persia, but they're very famous for their flowers, and this is a spectacular floral marbled paper. It's a single flat sheet of paper. The pattern is put down onto the, the size. The size is like a, a marbling bath. Think of um, a cookie sheet, a big square rectangular cookie sheet, but a little deeper than a cookie sheet, filled with water, and the water's been thickened. So it's got stuff in it to make the water a little thick. You drop your pigments down, and all those blue pigments are dropped down with a chemical that disperses them into that pattern there. And then they drop circular droplets of green, and with a needle or a stylus, they pull those little droplets because the droplets are not floating around on the surface. They're sitting there because the, the surface has been thickened a little bit. And they can manipulate those, those droplets into the shape of the stem and, and the leaves of the plant. Then they drop another droplet of red at the tip of one of the stems and with a needle and you can see how the needle has pulled that little circular droplet in and in and in and in to make the petal and the leaves it's all manipulated by hand it takes about maybe half hour to make this pattern 40 minutes or so to make this sheet of paper once the pattern sitting on the surface of this bath is already is ready to go. They take a sheet of paper, which has been prepared. You cover the sheet with a, a wash of alum, because the alum is a mordant, that is a glue, which makes the pigment stick to the surface of the sheet. And they wait till the sheet dries. Then they lower that down onto the surface of the bath, and the, the mordant makes the pigment stick to the surface of the marbled sheet, of the sheet, and it comes out like that. So, that's how marbling is done. It's a very amazing craft. Um, man in Pennsylvania, Richard Wolf, does his fishbowl marbles. He does this pattern, this, um, this pattern back as a backdrop. Then he takes a drop of water and he drops it onto the surface of this, mar of this pattern and it pushes the pigments aside and it creates this little opening in the middle. And then inside that opening, he does a lo another little marbling, you see. And with his needle, he pulls out the little fish. That's a fish, fishbowl marble, he calls it. This is 
suminagashi. This is a Japanese method of marbling paper that goes back to the 12th century. Now, suminagashi, all you do is take a brush with the pigment in the brush and you dip it onto the surface of a bath of water and some of the pigment gets pulled out and it floats as a circle onto the surface of the water. And then with another brush, the artist touches that circle in the middle of that circle with another brush with ha that has only water in it and it pushes a circle out into a ring. And then another drop of pigment and another drop of water until you have all these rings, dozens and dozens of them. And in this case, the artist was using blue and gray, blue and gray. So he's got brush with gray, a, a, a brush with gray, a brush with blue pigment in it, and a brush with water in it. And alternating, dipping, 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 all these little circles get pushed out into lines on the page. And then using his breath by blowing or his hand to make the air move over the surface or a paper fan the artist moves the pigments around into this pattern that you see and then puts the sheet of paper on and the, sh the pattern is transferred to the sheet. Now that was 12th century when that was invented, the sumi nagashi. Sumi means ink, the sumi nagashi means the floating of ink and that's what you're doing here. So sumi nagashi has been around for, you know, 900 years, um, 800 and some years. Um, it made its way to the West on the Silk Road. And because artists and bookbinders saw it around, I don't know, 1500, maybe 1550s, they knew what it was, but they didn't know how it was made. And that got them to doing their own experiments to create marbling the way we know it now, that kind of marbling. Western marbling like this is done in a different way. The Japanese marbling is done this way, but it's essentially the same thing, floating your patterns on the surface of a, of a bath and laying a sheet of paper over it. Now, I've already shown you one watermark. These are a couple of the others that were in our collection. Uh, you might recognize her, somebody I never met, but I, I think you might know her anyway. Um, one of the most amazing watermarks in the history of mankind is this one. It's, if you saw this sheet of paper, you would not believe your eyes. You think you're in a cave with stalactites and stalagmites looking down through that cave. This is a large sheet of paper. It's about 18 by 26 inches. And it's now in Texas. It's one of the ones that I miss the most, but that's okay. It's happy there. Um, but that is a, a special kind of paper. This was done in 1983, this sheet. Um, Fabriano Paper Mill in uh, Italy is famous for these kinds of watermarks. They're called shadow marks or light and shade watermarks. That's what they're, that's the name of them. The Japanese have their own method. Look at that. I, I, the, the photograph doesn't do it justice. It's a magnificent sheet of paper. Just hold it up to the light, and that's what you see. Um, the Japanese have a, a completely different method of creating them. I'd like to go through a whole bunch of spectacular, wonderful sheets to show you just a, some of the range of the things that were in the collection. Um, an 18th century block printed paper on an early manuscript. Um, everything you see is in Texas now, unfortunately. Well, fortunately, I'm happy that they have them. I miss them though, it's like their kids going off to school. Um, another block printed sheet. Now this is an unusual one. This one was a 1780s French almanac. But what's so interesting was they bound the cover using this block printed paper. But look, they used a marbled paper for the spine of the book. Very unusual to mix those two papers, those two kinds of paper. Now, 
how did they do this one? How could they have carved the block? Well, the, the basic areas, the darkest areas, are all hand carved out of the woodblock. But all these little dots are pins that were hammered into the block, little pins, so that they didn't have to carve all those things into the wood, sur wood surface, you see. And they hammered those pins in in such a way that they're the same height as the part of the block that's going to print. So when they put the ink onto the wood block, all those little pins got inked. And then they put a sheet of paper over it and put it through a press. And this is what comes out. The sheet comes out like that. Um, another wonderful three color. Uh, no, this is only a, this is only a, uh, yeah, it's a three color wood block. In other words, three blocks, one for black, one for the red, and one for that pale blue. So it takes three blocks to make that paper, three separate blocks. Uh, one thing I meant to mention, we have four of the 18th century wood blocks in our collection. Um, I don't have a slide for them here, I don't believe. Um, the Japanese do embedded papers. I mean, it's done in other parts of the world, but the Japanese were the true geniuses. So they, they make a sheet of paper and they embed leaves and other things into the sheet. This is a, a huge 20 inch by 40 inch sheet of paper filled with these leaves and filled with butterfly wings. These are real butterfly wings. Now, the part of the butterfly that you could not into the sheet, torso or the, what do you call it? The, the central part of the, where the wings are attached. So that's paper. That's a little piece of paper in there and here. But these are real butterfly wings and ginkgo leaves and maple leaves. Oops. So that, and another thing to look at, the Japanese figured out a way of putting silver and gold flecks into their paper. Unbelievable. This is a magnificent sheet. Huge, huge sheet of paper. Um, this is a stencil, um, a, a stencil sheet. This was a sheet done, uh, this is a chiogami done from stencils. Another elegant piece of paper. Um, another thing I should mention was that when you, when you have one color, you need one stencil. If you have two colors, you need two stencils. If you have 25 colors, you need 25 separate stencils. Uh, one of the things that my wife and I collected was um, the, the stencils called katazome. These katazome stencils uh, are very rare, and especially the, the, um, uh, the Meiji era ones from the 18... 60s up through about 1912 when the Meiji era came to an end. The, um, the, the, we had about uh, 250 of the original Meiji stencils. We saved a few of them, but about 220 of them are, are now in Texas along with the collection. Here's another piece of lace paper. Wonderful sheet and another one. They come in many, many different patterns. Um, and a piece of block printed paper that was used for this little table topper thing, little decorative thing here. Um, a, a famous paper maker in England, uh, the Cockerell, Sidney Cockerell and his brother Douglas Cockerell were some of the most important marblers in history. And we had a couple hundred of their sheets uh, another magnificent piece of Dutch gilt paper. Almost always, they'll have some damage to them. This is, I don't think this is damaged because the sheet is in, intact. I think it was just a badly printed one. But to find full sheets of them is almost unheard of. You almost never find them. You almost find them always on books in little snippets where they cut them up and put them on covers of books. Um, oops. 
Now, the and and saints were very popular uh, uh, images on these uh, sheets. This one was a particularly marvelous one, and um, we ate pasta for a long time. In fact, I. I, I told my students, these sheets were so expensive that the pasta that we had to eat was part of buying the sheets. So I have a picture of the pasta there that we that made the, the purchase of these sheets uh, possible. Um, we had, we still have a collection of paper made from alternate fibers. Now, if you look closely, we have in this one collection, red mulberry bark bird's nests, a sheet made from a bird's nest, uh, bearded iris, butterfly weed, cat tail, curly dock, hickory, and so on, kenaf, lemongrass, lilac, milkweed, and so on and so on. This one collection that we have, and it's up here um, near my, uh, above my elbows here, has about, um, 90 or 100 sheets, all made from really, really weird materials. Um, women in uh, New Mexico went all over the country picking up these strange stuff and making these crazy papers. They're wonderful papers. Can't be, use them for anything, but they're beautiful. Um, a sheet made by a, a marbler in Australia. Wonderful, delightful sheet with most of the standard patterns of marble paper have names. This one doesn't have a name. Um, here is um, an Oklahoma marbler with his rainbow marble, um, a pattern that nobody else can make because you have to, to comb out the patterns on the surface of the marbling bath. You have a long piece of wood with the teeth like a comb coming out of them. And it's called the marbler's comb. So he had a comb that was actually two layers of comb, one next to the other. And by using rubber bands and rubbing, putting his fingers close together and apart, he can manipulate the combs so that the teeth got closer together, further apart, closer together, further apart, as he's doing his pattern in the marbling bath. He creates a pattern that nobody else can do. Um, Galen Berry is his name. Uh, his colors, you know, are trying to get to, uh, you're trying to stay awake some night, you're falling asleep. Come look at one of his sheets. That'll wake you up because he uses these bright colors. Here's another, a different marbler from um, Australia. And a paste paper maker from uh, Vermont and another paste paper maker. These are all, all of these sheets that you're seeing are all hand done. They're not, they're, no, they're, which means that they're all unique. They're all one of a kind. Um, an 18th century block printed paper and another one. Um, now here's a very, very rare Dutch gilt paper with no colored paste behind it. And the ones with the animals, the birds that we saw before, this is unbelievably desirable to collectors. And with the big elephant in the middle and the giraffe and the zebra and so on, this is, uh, well, I won't tell you, this is another, let's eat pasta for a few months sheet of paper there. Um, another one where the maker has used three colors of paste underneath a light blue, a dark blue, and then that orangey color. These are, this is a sheet from about 1770. And then the gold foil has been stamped using a probably a copper plate over the surface of the sheet. Um, another Dutch gilt with a, on a cover of a book with a block printed spine on the book. Uh, let's go back to a couple more watermarks. This is a Western watermark, also from the Fabriano Company. This one is a Japanese one, done using finger fingers and and uh, cloth. The sheet of paper is made, 
And while it's still wet, before the sheet has finally dried off, they use a spe they have a special technique with a special kind of fabric on their finger and tools to push the fibers aside. What do you see when you see a watermark? Let's go back to this one, where the paper is really thin, lots of light will shine through the sheet. You see that at the dome there where it's light, where the words are here, the letters, the, th the sheet is very thin, so a lot of light will shine through. Where the paper is thicker, less light will shine through. Well, the Japanese figured out a way to move fibers around to thicken them up in some places and to thin them out in others. Look at the stars in the sky, this poor crow sitting on the branch with the snow coming down. That's snow, snowflakes, the, the crow in snow. I just made up the title of that. Anyway, these are fantastic, fantastic pieces of paper. Um, just as a footnote to all of this, watermarking was made illegal in Japan because it was used as a security measure to make security papers, currency, and banks trying to, um, you know, moving uh, stocks and currency from one uh, venue to another. And if you, you can, you might be able to print as a forgery, but if you can't do it on the right kind of paper, a watermarked sheet, then it's going to be an obvious forgery. So watermarking was a, a tool used to prevent forgeries. So the Japanese developed this method of creating watermarks, and then it was made illegal. Well, when the book, The Handmade Papers of Japan, was published in 1952 by an American, by the way, he wanted a special suite of watermarks and got a special dispensation from the Japanese government to do a whole suite of 20 of these watermarks. So they, they all appear in the Handmade Papers of Japan, uh, a guy named Tyndale. It's the most important book on the history of papermaking in Japan, especially the history of handmade papers in Japan. And um, uh, Tyndale was the author, he and his wife. Well, I met his son. Tyndale was long gone by the time I met the son. And I said, I'd like to write a book about their parents' book his parents' book, The Handmade Papers of Japan. So he gave me access to the family archives, and I wrote a whole book, which this is my book, The Handmade Papers of Japan. And uh, it incorporates images of all of those uh, watermarks. The original Handmade Papers of Japan has the suite of 20 watermarks in it. Does anybody here read Japanese? Well, Here's the joke, folks. This was done in 150 copies, and the binder decided to print the handmade papers of Japan in Japanese on the cover, and he printed it upside down. You see that? I got my copy in the mail. I looked at it, and I said, that looks a little funny. I went into the frontispiece that faces the title page, and it has this right side up. So I called the binder, and he says, oh, my God, he had already bound 150 copies, except this one and the one that he had sent to the publisher and the one that he had kept for himself. All the other 147, he had to rip the bindings off and rebind the whole book in this Japanese silk cloth and beautiful leather spine with a gold stamped leather label on the spine. He had to redo 147 bindings. And there are only three copies of the book now with this upside down on it. Okay. And then my book, I told you on Chiogami paper, this is that book uh, bound by the same binder, by the way. Okay. So this sheet of paper is creped. You know what crepe paper is? That crinkle, yeah, it's crinkled. We we make, you know, streamers and you know birthday things out of them. This is a crepe sheet, and then the creping was done after the chiogami was printed on it. 
There's a very rare sheet here. Not too many were done this way. Here's another one of those Itajima, the folded and dyed sheets. Um, then a guy in England named Edward Seymour developed a means of decorating paper that looks like marbling. And here they are again. These are all one of a kind sheets. They're all one of a kind, but it's done using a very special machine that he invented. And I want to know about this machine because I had some of the papers in my collection and nobody knew much about this guy Seymour. He had a company called the Fancy Pill. You know much about it. So I did some research. I found his nephew living in Scotland and the nephew had the archives of the Fancy Paper Company. So I flew over there. I spent eight days doing research in the archives and I wrote a book called Edward Seymour and the Fancy Paper Company. And every copy of this book has 24 original samples tipped in to the book, original ones from Seymour, whose company went out of business in the early 1970s. But these are all one of a kind sheets. They're, they're, they're done by a machine. He called them art marbles, art meaning artificial not having anything to do with art, because some of them were pretty ugly, some of them were not so bad. Um, this is one of the katazome. This is a stencil. Get this. This is one color of a multicolored image. Remember I told you if you have three or four or five images, you need one stencil for each color of the image. This is one of the stencils, and this is a hand-cut stencil. You get that? There might be two or 3,000 holes in that stencil cut in that design, all cut by hand. And that's going to be one of the backgrounds to a larger image with maybe a two or three or 10 or 15 color. And this was in our collection. In fact, I, I think I still have this one in the collection. One of the things that we collected was anything having to do with decorated paper. I found in an antique uh, show gift wrap from the 1950s. This was a whole rack filled. You see all these things? These are filled with 1950s gift wraps. Lovely gift wraps from Denison. Company goes back to the 1870s, by the way, Denison. And it had all the original packages of the decorated gift wrap in it. So I had to get that. And of course, it came with the original if you can wait one second, I'll show you. Because when I, when I bought this, hold on, it came with the original 3M Scotch dispensers with the original decorated scotch tapes in the dispensers. Oh my God, I had to have this. I mean, come on, you're a, a lunatic collector. There's no difference between loving something and coveting it. And this I coveted, I had to have it. Um, anyway, there we had in the collection, there was a huge number of gift wraps from the 1890s all the way up through the, the, the middle of the 20th century, fabulous gift wrapping papers. We have a collection of 19th and, and early 20th century boxes. We have about two or 300 of these. These are still in my possession. They'll go to Texas someday. Um, marbled paper, paper uh, amato, the, the Mexican bark paper, block printed papers, um, wonder paper. It dusts and cleans and polishes all at once. This is Eagle A paper. This is a Papetier. This is a, a French stationery company from around 1870s. Um, we had lots of these boxes of paper. We have wallpapers. We had tons and tons of wallpapers. 
Texas now. But we have the wallpaper sample books we still have. We have 100 of them. Um, the sample books are amazing. And we had large pieces of really wonderful wallpapers, rolls of wallpapers. This is a, probably around 1900, give or take about 10 years, but it was the Colonial Wallpaper Company. And they were in business from around 1890 to around 1920s or something. Um, we had, you ready for this? About 600 sh full sheets of miniature dollhouse wallpapers. Wallpapers dull, done for dollhouses, dollhouses. And we had uh, hundreds of sheets of these. So these are little tiny sheets, little little ones done for for wall for the walls of dollhouses. We had the um, joss joss papers. These were Chinese um, um, papers done ceremonial papers. These were to be burned and sent up to the ancestors, so they had currency uh, of various kinds. You could buy one in the shape of a Cadillac. It was a piece of paper. You can buy clothing, houses, all kinds of stuff, all made out of paper. And some of them cut papers. Um, we still have a good, a sizable collection of origami. Um, uh, somewhere here, we have an umbrella. In fact, we have about a half dozen umbrellas made out of paper. You make it out of a good, solid paper made out of kozo fiber, the Japanese fiber that was most common. You varnish it with a waterproof varnish and it can take it right out into the rain. Um, so we have a number of those. Now, I know that you think I'm a little nuts and I'm now I'm about to prove it. We have a collection of about 2000 chopstick wrappers. They're all decorated papers, aren't they? They're paper. And they're decorated. Somebody designed them and printed them. And I, we have thousands of them. I won't show you the, wall, the, uh, the toilet paper ro roll wrappers because that's silly. I won't even mention those. OK, here's a notebook that some uh, artist in Massachusetts did, a notebook uh, with using a paste paper. Here is a little sculpture made out of marbled paper and a very special dipped Japanese paper that was made into a fan. They dip it into the vat with the dye and they've put a, 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 like a, a wax resist up to a certain point so that the dye doesn't continue to go into the paper any further. And then they take it out, they put another they put it in again to get a second color in it. So that, that's a, a Japanese handmade sheet. Now, you know what paper cuts are? We have, we, we had about uh, 2000 paper cuts in the collection. These are all hand done, mostly in China, but we have ones from uh, Norway and Sweden and Pennsylvania and so on. It's done by craftspeople all over the world, but the Chinese were the, were the greatest of them. One of the ones that went to Texas was six feet long, and it's a whole garden scene with about 12 women, and it's some of them reading a book, some doing needlework stuff. It was all cut for. I once told somebody I have 2,000 paper cuts, and she said, that must really hurt. I, not that kind of paper cut. Okay. Um, this is a mystery. This is a very unusual Dutch gilt paper with paste paper background, Dutch gilt here. You see Dutch gilt here. And then some kind of other decoration on top of it. It's a portable writing desk. It's probably German and it's probably right around 1700. And we can date it partly by the fact that when you open, this top part opens and a drawer pulls out. And when the top opens, it reveals two block printed papers inside. And these are right around 1700, maybe a little bit later than that. 
really unusual. Carly Frigga, the world's greatest marbler. This is one single sheet of paper. I wish you could see this close up. The, the fineness of the detail in the marbling here would knock your socks off. There's no way to capture this on a slide. Fabulous sheet of paper. This is one of her alchemy marbles, she calls it. She did a book, Alchemy and Marbling, which I helped her translate. She's Dutch. Uh, she's from the Netherlands, actually. And um, um, I went to her home and I saw this sheet of paper. And I said, got to have it. Well, I wound up with about 300 sheets of her papers. They were the most fabulous papers in the universe. Um, a marbler in Santa Rosa, California did this one. Magnificent sheet. Um, not so good, not worth looking at. This one was done by a, another... Um, uh, Australian marbler. I'm going to skip past a few of these because we're running out of time here. Um, these are um, also marbled sheets. Uh, one with this line that goes down. It's called Spanish marble. The story is that, or it's, it's called Spanish marble or Spanish ripple. Um, in Spain, some marbler showed up to work the delirium guns and he was shaking and when he was doing the marbling he created these lines in the page be because the marbling bath which is the water was having waves created and the way pushing all the pigments together so as he was dropping the paper down <clears throat> onto the surface this is what happened and his boss, have, it again. have another drink, because this was a whole new form of marbling that nobody had ever seen until about, about 1880, when Spanish marbling came in. Now everybody uses this technique. Instead of lowering your sheet down into the bath slowly and carefully so that you don't get a bubble underneath the sheet, because then the pigment doesn't touch the sheet and it leaves a white space on the sheet. The, the marbler lowers it down by, by bouncing the hand so that the sheet bounces and it makes the pigment uh, roam back and forth in the bath. Another wonderful sheet of marble paper. This is called tiger eye. Guess why? These are eyes. This is all done. This is one of Carly's sheets, tiger eye marble. Um, Another one um, doesn't have a name, this pattern, but it's a fairly common one. Uh, the Turks do this kind of thing. They'll do a background pattern. Then they'll put their little droplets down. This is a cherry pattern. These are all little cherries with their little stems on them. This is all done by hand, one little cherry at a time. So it takes a long time to do a sheet like this. Um, <clears throat> Richard Wolf. <clears throat> the man who did that fishbowl marbling, this is a double marble. He did this sheet. If you look closely, you, you'll see this pattern, this little pattern underneath the other pattern on top of it. The pattern on top are these black lines. But the pattern underneath, you can see it's two layers of marbling, two layers here, very rare. Well, it's not terribly rare, but it's hard to do it right. Here's another one that he did. You see that feather pattern underneath and the vein pattern with the dark lines on the top of it. Some marblers can do two layers of marbling. Some of them can do three layers of marbling. Carly Frigga sold me a sheet. Well, I don't have a slide of it. She sold me a sheet that had 10 layers of marbling. 10 and she dated them so along the edge of the sheet we know exactly which day she did each one of this of the 10 colors of marbling the patterns of marbling unbelievable it took her about um two weeks to do that one sheet unbelievable sheet nobody in the history of marbling could do that um another nice nothing extraordinary uh, a, a flower done by a Western marbler, also nothing extraordinary. This is Iris Nevins, one of the great Western marblers. She does these wonderful flowers. 
Tom Leach in New Mexico does these mystical sheets. He also, of all things, he marbled large pieces of X-ray film. <laughs> oh, what a wonderful image that is. See the marbling, and then you put it, a light behind it, and the whole thing changes, changes. Um, amazing. Um, Chris Wyman, one of the great Western marblers, died when he was 42 years old, a rare cancer. That was his um, Spanish guy. This is from Spain. This is um, Melana Hughes from Chicago, another Tom Leach sheet. Melana Hughes did this one as well. This we have hanging on the wall of our dining room. Look, she's taken the sheet of paper, which is this sheet here. She's put the marbling pattern down and then she puts a, a large drop of water in the middle. So it opens up an open area in the middle. So, it's, so all of that pigment has gotten pushed to the edge of that circle of pigment. Then she marbles the little flowers in the middle using needles and stuff to shape them. And then she puts the sheet down. Then she marbled the mat that it was bound in and she marbled the frame. So we have this in our dining room. And now what I like to think of as the greatest sheet of marbling ever done in the history of marbling, because I did it. This is one of mine. It's actually pretty ugly, but I'm proud of it. So there's one that I did. Um, and if you are interested, you can look up. Texas A&M University has the Berger Clunan collection of decorated papers, and they're, um, they're in the process of digitizing it. And the first group of digitized sheets, uh, a few hundred of them, maybe a thousand of them, are now up on the web somewhere. I don't know where yet. Um, and uh, eventually the, the entire collection will be uh, viewable on the web um, once they finish the, the digitizing. Uh, a last note, to make the um, university really interested in the collection, we spent six years cataloging the collection and it's cataloged at the item level which means that we have about 18,000 entries in the catalog because a few of the sheets that we had multiple copies of. So we had 18,000 entries in the catalog and we attached an image to each of those cataloging records. Um, the catalogers whom we employed, we did it ourselves and we hired some of our former students who were professional catalogers. Um, they kept saying, well, we're getting close. And I, I say, well, we just bought 200 more sheets. <laughs> Could have been done in about, in about three years, but the, we kept buying and they kept the catalogers in vittles for a few more years. Anyway, um, you just got me started. <laughs> um, I could go on until two in the morning, 12 days from now. Um, when we had the collection in our home, we had many, many groups of people who knew about it, heard about it, and wanted to see it. Book collectors clubs, the Guild of Book Workers, librarians. Uh, so we showed the collection to about 200, 250 people a year. Um, and um, they would come to our home, and we'd give them breakfast and lunch, and uh, spend the rest of the day looking at papers. They never got to see the whole collection, but they got to see some pretty nifty things in the meantime. Uh, one woman missed one of the meetings and called me and said, I didn't come with my friends. They all uh, went to your home and they said they had such a good time. Um, could I come and see your collection? And I said, oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, she says, uh, I don't drive at night. Can I stay overnight? I said, sure, come on down. She was from Santa Barbara and it was about a, a four and a half hour drive. So she said, I want to see the whole collection. And I said, well, you can't see the whole collection, but you can see a lot of it. You can come Saturday, some, Saturday morning and, you know, I got to be at work, you know, during the week. She says, it's fine. She comes down Saturday morning, just at the crack of dawn. And when she left the following Friday, she still hadn't seen the whole collection. 
And I, I, I told her, I, I gave her breakfast and dinner, but for lunches, you know, I said, I have to go to work. She said, I'll be, I'll be fine. So she spent a week looking at the collection. We are happy to show our collection to people. It's a research collection. That's why I write about it. That's why there's a catalog of it. So you have access to it. If you look up marble paper, if you look up by the name of a marbler, if you look up by date, by, by decoration type, by color, by year, the, the catalog record has all of the data fields searchable. So um, we now have about a thousand sheets in our collection. And if you're here in the Phoenix area, you're all welcome to visit and see what we have here. Some of our papers are in our place in Western Mass in uh, Williamsburg, but uh, we're not there too much anymore these days. Anyway. Dr. Berger, as always, this is completely fascinating. I am so pleased that you joined us tonight, really. And I know oh. how excited you are about your papers. Because yeah. Oh, you know this? <laughs> We were able as students to come see them in person and, and even even then it was it was such a joy. So um, do you mind we have a couple questions? Sure, I'm, I, I gotta get to bed by midnight, so let's hurry. Yeah, well, we're gonna take just a few more minutes. <laughs> okay, I was. <laughs> um, I think, I don't know if Anne is still with us, but I'll just say, um, first of all, Anne wanted to let everybody know that a good read would be The Island of Lost Maps by Miles Harvey. Right, That's I am what, quoted in that book. All right. Yeah. So my first, story, so my first question thing. was, um, yeah. what did they use to put the paste on when creating paste paper? Paste? Uh, we starch paste, rice starch paste, any paste will do. All you knew, you put it into a cup and you put some colored pigment into it, mix it up and you got a colored paste. And then you use a brush or a sponge and you just brush it over a, a dampened sheet. The sheet has to be a little dampened and you brush it over the sheet. And while the paste is still fresh, you can manipulate it by touching it, by moving it around. You, you take potato stamps, rubber stamps, a bottle cap, any kind of tool, an edging tool for um, making pie crusts, you know, and stuff like that, all kinds of things. You can, however you touch the paste while it's still wet, it disrupts the paste and it makes the patterns. Okay. So it's easy, easy to do. And then just let it sit out and dry. All right. Zip asked, um, how large was the Japanese stencil paper? The Japanese stencil sheets, some of them are huge, 20 by 40, huge ones. And we had um, about a thousand of those. Uh, a long story, which I don't want to get into. So the, the Meiji era ones were smaller. They were about uh, 12 by 16 or 14 by 18. And the stencils were about the, the, the you know, those sizes. Okay. Um, but they, but they made, it was the same technique that they used to color silk, to decorate silk, to make kimonos. Same technique, the, those katazome stencils that they had. So huge pieces of silk would be um, decorated with the patterns using that. So they can make very large stencils. Okay. Um, my next question, along with Anne's, kind of go to, they go go together. I had asked, were some of the Japanese papers simply for decoration, or were they used in some way in their time? And then Anne asked, were they the inside end papers for books? And you had shown some of that, I think. Yeah, Japanese papers, if they were simple, really simple geometric patterns, sometimes they would be used for book bindings but not too often, but you do find them. You do find them and, and you on the insides, you'll find them on the outsides of, of uh, Japanese books, which are traditionally soft cover books. And there's a long reason for that. They didn't have too many hardbacks because of the way the paper was and so on. But the, the papers had hundreds and hundreds of uses, mostly decorative. They would make screens, wall coverings, window coverings, um, decorative panels for walls. They used it to uh, to line boxes, to line uh, hats, to 
um, you know, do origami and all kinds of things. There are many, many, many decorative um, uses for them. And in the, the book that I wrote, Chiogami Papers, Chiogami Paper, it's called, which uh, you can't get it because it's out of print and it's gone. But there's a whole there's a whole chapter on uses of the paper. Many many uses. They are so beautiful. I love them. I love them. Um, next question: If not stamped with a date, how are you able to tell the age of the paper? Because I've looked at probably twenty or thirty thousand books on which the papers were used. And I know the dates of the books. Mm. And I know which, which patterns were common at what times, early 18th century, late 18th century. I know which, and I know which colors were common during which decades of which centuries. Now, once you get up into machine-made papers after about 1805 or so, and the machine decoration of papers in the 18 teens and 20s, it gets more difficult. But still, I know from, I mean, I've been dealing with rare books since the 1960s or early 60s. I know what papers were used to cover what books, and I know the approximate dates of those books. So, for example, if I see a certain block printed paper, I know that in the 1770s, the French were using that pattern on their almanacs, and those are dated, their children's books, some of which are dated, on their uh, their notebooks, some of which are dated, and so on. So I, I the longer you're in this, the more you know these kinds of things. Okay. And, and, and there are some reference books out there which will tell you that this Dutch gilt paper maker was working between 1720 and 1732. So, and I know that's a guy named Stoy or, or uh, Johann Meyer. Meyer and there's a, a guy named Munch, Johann Munch. And so I know their, their papers well, and I know the dates with, within which they were uh, working. And I've, I've read just about everything I could get my hands on on the, on the subject. So it sort of sinks in imperfectly, but at least I, I can tell you within a certain range when certain papers were done. All right. And um, Zip just wanted to let you know this has been fabulous and thank you so much. And Gary has one last question for us. And I don't know, perhaps people are um, unmuted and want to ask the final questions as well. But the last one in the chat says, um, how did you store the sheets of paper? Oh, yeah. People say, oh, you collect paper. That couldn't take up much space. Yeah. When you have 22,000 pieces, <laughs> it took up space. We had, we had a basement in our house in Wabin, which is a suburb of Boston. It's in Newton. And we had, I think, um, something like 130 drawers of flat files. You, were you there, Deborah? In the in the Wabin house, uh, Williams. I was only in Western Mass. Oh, the Western. Oh, well, you saw only the the little, the ten drawer cabinet. <laughs> yeah, we had a, something like 130 drawers of, and and they were full. They were full, <laughs> and you know. If if we ever emptied one out the next morning, they, they propagated. <laughs> they, papers just seem to come back. So, um, yeah, and right behind me, I don't know if you can see it. Over here, can you see this? Yes. This, this is um, another five-drawer cabinet, and we have another ten-drawer cabinet in the in the main part of the house here. Uh, so we have, we have only 15 drawers now of papers. Um, and they're full. Yeah. What can I say? Anybody want to unmute and ask uh, Dr. Berger any final questions for tonight? Um, I'd, I'd like to ask something, if I may. Sure. Um, hi, um, I'm Julie Stackpole. I'm a bookbinder in Thomaston, Maine. And um, I know I, about you. <laughs> yeah, I have a funny feeling that didn't you? 10 or 15 years ago, or maybe more, put out a call for papers to the Guild of Book Workers or something. 
I think I may have sent you some. Oh, yes, you did. And I'll tell you what happened. We had a flood in our house and the collection was in the basement. The Ooh. flood was filling up the basement and in total panic, I emptied all the bottom drawers of the cabinets first because those are the most vulnerable. And I brought, the, I ran up, I made 300 trips from the basement, first getting the papers up and then the library up because it was a whole, we had nine consecutive days of rain and the water table just filled the basement up to about nine inches in some places. So we had to clean, empty out the basement. And I was scheduled to give a talk on decorated paper and I was preparing to make my slides for the talk and I piled them all in giant piles into the living room and I had access to none of them. So I sent out a, a plea to people, I need papers for my talk. <laughs> and, and, and I said, I'll buy them if I have to just send papers. And oh, the, the paper community was wonderful. I got so many wonderful papers. I was able to do a great slide talk not with the great treasures that were buried in the living room, but with other great treasures. So yes, and Julie, I think maybe yours was one of them. I can't <laughs> remember your name. Yeah, so, that's yeah, that great. Was, it was a terrible trauma, but it turned out that we were able to acquire a few hundred spectacular, wonderful papers from really wonderful artists and, and generous, wonderful people. So yeah, that was, that's one way to build your collection. Yeah. <laughs> nice connection, Julie. I'm glad you're yeah. with us. Yes, yeah, I, thank I, you. I knew I recognized the name. Anybody else for tonight? So glad you all stayed with us. Well, thanks for being here, everybody. My email is <laughs> sid at simmons.edu. If you want to call me, you know, write me or anything. I'd be happy to chat with you about anything having to do with books and rare books and appraisal and paper and stuff like that. That's my life. So I'm happy to do it. Thank you, Dr. Berger. I put that in the um, chat at the beginning. So hopefully people saw that. And I'm just going to end by saying uh, that this concludes our presentation for the evening. And all of us at Vos Library, thank you for attending our Zoom with Vos Wednesday series. We hope that you'll help spread the word and also join us on Wednesday, February 13th at 6 p.m. where children's book author Wendy Ulmer will discuss three of her books and share her craft of being an author. Good night, be well, and stay healthy, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.